Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're so glad you could join us today for a very special program. We will be celebrating the 90th birthday of the great Willie Mays, and we'll do that through our virtual author series. John Shea has written a book that came out last year, 24, Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid. We'll officially greet John momentarily. Uh, this, uh, again, is the book, but we do want to remind folks as well that all of these programs are brought to you through the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. They're our sponsor throughout the 2021 year, and we do appreciate Ford Motor Company's uh, support of our virtual programs here in Cooperstown. Uh, this is a book that came out a year ago, and like many authors, they were caught in the limbo, if you will, of 2020. Uh, John Shea uh, joining us today, continuing to promote the book. This is our first opportunity to talk to John about his book, 24 Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid. And it is a book that we have available at our website. In fact, we have signed copies of it. Uh, you can see our website link there, shop.baseballhall.org. Again, that's shop.baseballhall.org. And then go to the search button and just type in 24 Life Stories. It'll bring you directly to John's book, and you can order a signed copy from John Shea. Uh, John, this is the first time I've had a chance to meet you, talk to you. It's a, a real pleasure. How are you doing? Well, <laughs> Hey, I'm doing fine. It's a holiday, right? Willie Mays is 90th. I mean, uh, wonderful to, to be with you. The, the greatest place on earth is where you are right now, right? Well, one of, without question, one of. Uh, John, for those not familiar, has been a longtime baseball writer, uh, is the national baseball writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, and author of books as well. This uh, a book that is geared in some ways toward uh, young adults and children, but also to an adult audience as well. And we'll certainly discuss that. But John, I do want to begin with the theme of this being Willie's 90th birthday and what all that means to us. Let's, um, let's try to put things into perspective. Uh, we're going to talk about this photograph in a couple of moments. It's a neat photo from 1972. But as you digest that 90th birthday for Willie Mays. I saw Willie play toward the end of his career. I was very young. Uh, I saw him really 1971, 72, 73. Uh, it's hard for me to remember too many players that I saw play that are 90 years of age that have reached that milestone. How do you put something like this in perspective? What does it mean to you as a, a fan and as a friend of Willie? Mm. My, oh my, 90 years old and Shoot, I, and like you, caught the end of his career, uh, mid to late 60s, early 70s. And I saw the greatness. I am from the Bay Area. I, you know, took the bus out to the ballpark and saw the great maze in center field. And even in 1971, when his, he played his final season in San Francisco, he was 40 years old and he led the National League in walks and on base percentage. He, he stole 23 bases, 26 attempts. Uh, and, and I mean, he still was 18 home runs, still was an overall player. His last really good year and, uh, and the three hitter for a team that won the division in 71. And then obviously the following May, uh, Horace Stoneham, the owner of the Giants, financially strapped as he was, couldn't afford $165,000, all of Willie Mays' salary. And sent him to the Mets back home. Uh, Joan Payson was the owner of the Mets and you know, previously a, a minority owner of the New York Giants. So long association with Willie Mays and brought him back to New York and played you know, a couple of seasons there and finished it off at his final hit against Raleigh Fingers, game two of the 1973 World Series. But, but you look back and it's not really just the ball player, but the man and and, you know, the exemplary life and the fact that he, as a kid growing up with his father, Willie uh, Howard May Sr., uh, Piper Davis, his manager with the Black Barons and the Negro Leagues, uh, Leo DeRocher, all these great role models for him. Monty Irvin, the great legendary Hall of Famer who played half of his career in the big leagues, 
uh, was his first roommate in New York, you know, even though he was 10 years older. So all these all these people are great role models. So Willie's spending his whole life paying it back, really, uh, you know, helping kids, helping teammates, helping teams, helping whomever. Um, and that's what he's been all about, really, for most of his life, giving back. And he's still doing it today. Let's talk, John, a little bit about this photograph from May 6, 1972. Uh, it's part of our collection, our vast photo collection that we have in our library here in Cooperstown. It's, it's a great shot uh, of him uh, getting a birthday cake from the Phillies at Veterans Stadium. You ever seen this photograph before? Do you remember this at all? You know, there's a whole bunch of pictures with Willie Mays and cakes uh, from the Houston Astrodome, from Dodger Stadium. And, you know, May 6th, every year, you know, just a great time of year. The spring is here and, and every team is still alive. Uh, and, and here's Willie May celebrating his birthday. No matter where he went, they had a big celebration for him. So, yeah, this is one yeah. of a few. Now, the, the other side story here is the fact that less than a week, five days later, he'd actually be traded from the Giants to the New York Mets. I wonder if he knew when he was eating this birthday cake that this was impending, that this was something that was about to happen. There had, I guess, been some rumors about it, but until it's a done deal, it's, you know, it's, it's not a done deal until it actually happens. Um, what do you remember about those days leading up to his departure from San Francisco and what it was like for Giants fans reacting to the departure of a legend? Oh, there were a lot of tears throughout the Bay Area, throughout the city. Uh, yeah, I was I was a kid, and I remember that day vividly. It's like, are you serious? Why? Why would I imagine it's the same feeling New Yorkers felt when they took the Giants away and moved them uh, to San Francisco and Brooklynites? You know, when they took the Dodgers uh, across the country to L.A. Uh, all of a sudden, one day he's here, the next day he's gone. And even though he was 40, he was coming off that great 1971 season, but May of 72, you know, there were rumors, yeah, because Horace Stoneham was slowly but surely, the Giants weren't real good in the trade market. I mean, they, they gave away Cepeda for not much. And the next year, he's the MVP uh, with St. Louis and the World Series champ. Uh, they gave away Gaylord Perry for not much. And in the ensuing years, he wins a Cy Young in Cleveland and San Diego. Uh, they gave away George Foster for not much, and he goes to the big red machine and shines. Uh, all these great players, you know, and they eventually got rid of Marichal, and, and McCovey was dealt to San Diego, and it later came back. But uh, it, it just seems that uh, they didn't have a real good track record of uh, uh, getting rid of their stars for much in return. And Mays was, what, uh, Charlie Williams, a relief pitcher. His whole career will be known as the guy who uh, traded for Mays, but... Uh, you know, I guess more than that, it was a way for Willie uh, to be financially set because Joan Payson gave him a 10-year a, a personal service contract at 50 grand a year uh, you know, just to be Willie Mays and play golf and help the kids put on the uniform, sign autographs, do all those things that, you know, teams love out of uh, as somebody like that, uh, an icon. So, so anyway, uh, he's, it, 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 he told me that, you know, he's, he's had very few regrets in life. One of them was not going to college. You know, this is a guy, maybe unlike Jackie, who went to UCLA, Willie signed right out of high school. And a year later, uh, less than a year later, he's a center fielder in New York at the Polo Grounds. And, um, you know, so very few regrets. One of the regrets was being traded back to New York, but that didn't last long because eventually he was so welcomed in that clubhouse by, you know, Kuzman and, and Seaver and, and Tug and all those, you know, legendary Mets that, uh, we're part of the 69 team and eventually the 73 team, uh, both World Series participants. So it didn't take long for him to regain that comfort in New York and feel at home again. You mentioned the reliever Charlie Williams they acquired. Uh, they got $50,000 in cash, which in today's baseball is, um, well, it's not enough to get you a utility player. Minimum salary is over $400,000, but I guess – Back in 72, 50000 was uh, a fairly decent sum of money, but certainly not much compensation for a great player. Were the fans just downright furious about him being traded away, or did they understand the circumstances? Oh, I don't think they understood it. You, you don't trade Mays. Um, but uh, it, it took him a long time to return, not till 1986 when the next owner, Bob Lurie, uh, and then you have to remember, 
Uh, Willie Mays was a Hall of Famer. And by the way, 23 people did not vote for him. So when we say yeah. that uh, Derek Jeter wasn't unanimous with one vote shy, Willie Mays, 23 people thought he wasn't worthy of Cooperstown induction. So uh, anyway, that, yeah, um, 1979, he's inducted. And right away after, Major League Baseball suspends him. Well, why? Because of the association with the casino valleys. And what did he do there? Well, he signed some autographs and played some golf and hung out with clients. That's all he did. He didn't gamble. You know, it wasn't a Pete Rose situation. Um, yeah. And Mickey Mantle, same thing. Both of them worked for casinos and Bowie Kuhn in, in Infinite Wisdom suspended both. Peter Ubaroff comes along after putting the 84 uh, Olympic Games together. And then uh, early 85, he's the commissioner and brings back Willie and Mickey. And then 1986, Bob Lurie and Al Rosen calls and say, hey, come back home, come back to the Giants. So Willie Mays has been with the Giants ever since. So that's that's kind of a forgotten uh, black mark in the Giants history, the fact that they traded him. But uh, I guess fans have been digging it ever since that he's back uh, home. John, let's talk a little bit about the process of putting this book together. You have known Willie for a while now. You're pretty good friends with him from everything that I have heard. And my understanding is that you approached him a few years back. There have been a number of biographies written about Willie. But you wanted to do something a little bit different. And my understanding is that Willie wanted a book that could go into the libraries that would be good for kids to read. Tell us a little bit more about the process of this collaboration with Willie and how it got started. Yeah, thanks. No, I probably asked him 15 years ago, what about a book project, Willie? Because as national baseball writer at the San Francisco Chronicle, I got to know him pretty well. Um, you know, in that role, I was able to step back from the daily coverage a lot of times and get to know the characters uh, throughout history. And Willie obviously visited the clubhouse all the time, maybe unlike a lot of uh, alumni from teams who don't necessarily show up much. Willie's always there. McCovey was the same way. You know, hmm. Cepeda would drop by and, and you know, all these legends who are now statues out front of the ballpark and, you know, uh, iconic Hall of Famers. Uh, but it was always Mays, you know, front and center. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a ride. And um, uh, when, he, when I asked him about the book, say 2005-ish, he said, I would like to see a book in classrooms. So that meant right away, well, let's go inspirationally themed mm -hmm. and 24 life stories with the Say Hey Kid, but also 24 life lessons from the Say Hey Kid. Um, you know, what motivated him, what encouraged him, what inspired him and how he inspired the next generation and continues to inspire. And all the stories, uh, I spent more than 100 hours with Willie for the purpose of the book and mm -hmm. interviewed more than 200 people, including 30 plus Hall of Famers. How lucky am I, you know, to be able to hang out, not just with Willie, but have others kind of supplement and complement his stories and bring those stories back to Willie. And basically what I did was put it on the tee for Willie and let him swing away because, you know, his voice resonates and um, his voice throughout the book is bold face. So I kind of set him up. Everybody else sets him up. And then he takes off with the conversation, whatever it might be, his four home runs in Milwaukee, the 16th inning uh, home run against Warren Spahn for Marischal to win one, nothing, uh, the catch at the polo grounds game one of the 54 series. You know, these are all separate chapters, but there's also a chapter a uh, separate one with, you know, Hank Aaron. I was fortunate to speak with him a lot about Willie and Willie on Hank. And that could be a book in itself. Uh, you know, Willie, Mickey and the Duke is, you know, he loved those guys, the center fielders in New York. His father is a chapter. Uh, uh, Barry Bonds and Bobby Bonds. Uh, the two Bonds is father and son who meant a lot to Willie and vice versa, uh, a chapter. And the current Giants uh, fans, they're all chapters. Uh, like I said, Barack Obama is a separate chapter. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a chapter on the five tools in which Willie breaks down hitting, hitting for power, uh, you know, the speed, the, the, the throwing, the fielding, uh, all the elements of a five tool player, which Willie is uh, the epitome of. So, uh, it, boy, what a wonderful experience to actually hang with Willie, go back to Birmingham for a while, research his roots, speak to a lot of people. Bill Greeson, uh, three time American hero who was Willie's teammate in the 19 in 1948 the the last uh negro league world series they were teammates and uh, uh reverend greason is still preaching at 96 uh, mm -hmm. back in birmingham and willie and uh the reverend communicate quite a bit but 
Yeah. So, so just some legendary characters I was able to uh, interview and uh, the, uh, you know, uh, bring stories back to Willie and have uh, Willie kind of uh, uh, take it to another level with, with an, you know, the next conversation. So, man, what an experience, a project of a lifetime, really. 100 hours of sitting down with Willie Mays. How'd you find his recall of events? Oh, my gosh. You know, luckily we have baseball reference uh, and, and, you know, the, the which gives us every box score, um, you know, it, it, as far back as, you know, pre-Willie, obviously. And we'd, we'd have conversation. You tell me about a seventh inning double into the gap. And and uh, I said, I said, come on, I'm writing it down, but I, I, I got to double check this. And sure, yeah, I get home and double check. It's, it's a double into the gap. This is exactly what the, the recall for Willie and so many of these legends is just unbelievable. And, you know, and I've covered, you know, Tony Gwynn and Barry Bonds, all the greats of today. I'm sure Trout and Mookie are the same, but they, man, the recall is unbelievable. I, I don't know what I had for lunch, but these guys remember things that happened decades and decades ago. Um, because it just mattered so much to them, and it still does. John, I'm curious about his relationship with Barry Bonds' father, Bobby. Now, Bobby mm -hmm. did pass away a number of years ago, so um, you may have talked to him, you know, you've been in San Francisco for a long time, and you may have interviewed Bobby, you know, years and years ago, but I understand they were very, very close. They may have been best of friends when they were with the Giants together in the early 70s. Tell us a little bit more about that relationship between Bobby and Willie. Well, it's a lot of pressure to be the next Willie Mays. And that's what Bobby Bonds was supposed to be. Just like Bobby Mercer in the Bronx was supposed to be the next Mickey, right? Well, it just so happened that Mercer and Bonds were traded for each other. But, but Bobby Bonds was, was a tremendous athletic presence and a wonderful baseball player. The five tools. I mean, it was, it was, it was Willie who started this 30-30 club. And it's Bobby who took it to another level, as well as his son, Barry. I mean, they're all big time members year after year after year, the homers and the steals. And then Barry obviously did the 40-40. Then when I asked Willie about how come you didn't do 40-40, he said, well, if you told me it was important, I would have done it. You know, <laughs> he should probably do it in his sleep if he wanted to. But, you know, he stole bases like many people did back then uh, to win games, not necessarily to compile stats. So the, the relationship was real tight. Um, Willie took Bobby under his wing and guided him and helped him in so many different ways on and off the field, just like a father figure. And then they traded Bobby and it was a sad day, you know, for the giants again, you know, they didn't get much in return. And Bobby went on to have a lot of good years uh, beyond San Francisco. But um, so years later and, and Barry, this little five-year-old was always in the clubhouse, by the way, uh, in Willie's last year, you know, going through his gum collection and, and seeds and following them out to center field and trying the basket catch and falling over and trying to emulate to say, Hey kid, well, years later, uh, you know, he's this great high school presence and uh, he comes to Willie cause he's wondering, well, the giants drafted me. Uh, Frank Robinson is the manager and he really wants me here. And you know, they're offering $70,000 and Barry says, well, how about 75? And the giants say no. So he goes to Arizona state, but that's where Willie Mays wanted him to go. He wanted him to go to school because Willie, you know, one of his regrets, like I said, was not going to college. He didn't have that experience that a lot of uh, people, including in baseball, you know, get, you know, and ought to get. So uh, <laughs> Willie uh, continues not only to tutor, you know, Bobby, but but now Barry. And then uh, Bobby, unfortunately, died in the early 2000s and and Willie was at the hospital, you know, shortly before he passed. And one of the things Bobby told Willie was, you know, take care of my kid because he's the only guy that will, you know, you're the only guy he'll listen to, you know, if I'm not around, you're it. And Willie said, Oh my God, you know, and said, okay, I will. So throughout all the steroids issue and the PEDs and the Belco and, uh, you know, all those years and, you know, chasing the records, including Willie's, and, and Hanks and Babes going after all these wonderful milestones. It was Willie who really was at his side. Maybe he didn't agree with what was going on in the game at the time, but he promised Bobby he would be there for Barry, and he was. It was pretty amazing to see. They're still close? Oh, yeah. Uh, from what I hear, uh, Barry's going to hang with Willie tomorrow night. 
Now the Giants are supposed to celebrate his 90th. They're off today. This is Thursday, his birthday. Now Friday, tomorrow uh, is the homestand opener against San Diego. So the Giants are celebrating and Barry's supposed to be in the house and pay a visit to his suite. And Willie's supposed to be on the field pregame. You know, that, that's going to be pretty cool because it'll be his first game since the end of the 19 season back when Bruce Bochy was a manager. So he missed all of 2020, like most people did, uh, unable to get to the park, but now he's able and, you know, vaccined and everything like that. So uh, they're going to make a, quite a splash for him. Deservedly nice. so. Nice to hear the Mays will be back at the ballpark tomorrow night. One of the themes that you explore throughout the book is how Willie overcame the poverty of his youth. Tell us about Willie growing up in Westfield, Alabama, what that day-to-day life was like. Yeah, born in Westfield and then uh, spent most of his youth in Fairfield, a neighboring town, which is real close to Birmingham. And these were, these were you know, steel mill towns, um, you know, hardworking folks. Uh, and uh, yeah, there, there's poverty, uh, but it's, it's, it's not something Willie looks back on in a negative light. His father, Willie Howard May Sr., who was young when Willie was born, you know, didn't stay with the woman who was Willie's mother. And she went on to have 11 kids elsewhere. Um, so Willie mostly stays with the father, but also his mother's two sisters, uh, Willie's aunts, and who were very young as well. So it, it was a rough place, a rough time, but Willie always made the best of it and looks back on it so fondly because he had family, he had friends, he had food, he had clothes, and he had nearby ballparks to play. And, you know, Birmingham, maybe the most segregated city in the country at the time through the 60s, at least 1964, um, made it illegal for blacks and whites to play with each other. And Willie tells me that, that, you know, he said, well, who cares? We're going to do it anyway. And the cops came and broke up these games. And then the kids would wait until the cops left. And then they started playing again. And it it, it was just, uh, you know, from Willie's childhood, it was you know, it don't matter what, what the, what the background is, what the skin color is. And that's kind of what he preaches still. He, you know, I mean, he was the guy who, who brought, uh, you know, Johnny Roseboro off the field after Marichal clubbed him. You know, there's pictures of Willie in a sea of blue going over to the Dodger dugout, you know, grabbing his shirt and pulling him off the field. And, you know, it was Willie who in the 73 playoffs, when, uh, all Mets fans were throwing all this stuff at Pete Rose, uh, uh, you know, for sliding hard into Bud Harrelson. It was Willie who went out and talked to the fans with a couple of other Mets and said, hey, cool it. And the fans did. So, uh, you know, he also ended a mutiny uh, possibility in the early 60s against Alvin Dark when a lot of Latino uh, players were ready to just walk out because they didn't like the way Alvin was treating the minorities on the team. And it was Willie who gra- gathered all these players in, in the team uh uh, 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 hotel in Pittsburgh and, and told him and say, Hey, don't play for that man. Play for me, play for your, yourself, play for each other. Um, and, and, uh, anyway, it turned out to be a great story with Alvin who apologized to all these great players later in life, because as Orlando told me, he didn't want to, he didn't want to die with that in his heart. And it was Willie who kind of instigated that, who got them all together and made all that happen. So man, there's just countless stories about how Mays, you know, brings people together. And that's kind of what he still does. John, you mentioned Birmingham and the segregation there. If I recall correctly, they had a law called the Checkers Rule or the Checkers Law. It said that blacks and whites could not even play checkers together. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable yeah. the, the level of the separation yeah. that took place. Bull Connor was uh, the police chief at the time. And Bull Connor, actually, Willie Mays knew who this guy was because he was actually the play-by-play voice of the Birmingham Barons, which was the white team, which was a double-A team of the Boston Red Sox when Willie was a kid. So he knew this voice was. He didn't know he was the the white supremacist who, who, you know, uh, later in life would would bring, you know, dogs and and fire hoses onto the demonstrators uh, through Birmingham, you know, who marched uh, in in peace for for rights and equality, 
But sure enough, um, you know, what happened in Birmingham was televised uh, and people across the country were appalled. And that sort of was a genesis of the civil rights movement and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So that's the kind of area that Willie Mays grew up in. And despite all that, you know, he overcame and, you know, wouldn't let the bigots win and persevered and fought and, and not physically. You never saw Willie start a fight. You never saw him thrown out of a game. You never saw him charge a mound. He was always the guy breaking up those old uh, Brooklyn and New York uh, giant fights from yesteryear. But yeah, I mean, everybody loved Willie. And, and there's a whole lot of reasons he's, um, you know, looked at like he is today. And a lot of this goes back to his roots because, you know, he always took the right road and he thanks his father for leading the way. John, how did Willie view playing in the Negro Leagues with the Birmingham Black Barons? Was he at the time upset that he had to play segregated baseball or was he so young that he was just appreciative of an opportunity to play professionally? It was the latter. Um, his dream as a kid, the ultimate, was to play for the Birmingham Black Barons, a legendary team that, you know, Satchel Paige once played for a couple of decades earlier. And he said, if he could do that, that's heaven. There's no more to it because he knew as a kid there were no minorities, there were no blacks, there were no African-Americans in Major League Baseball. It wasn't allowed. Well, one day, Willie's father came to him and said, now you got a chance. And Willie said, what are you talking about? Now you got a chance to play in the big leagues. And what do you mean? Jackie Robinson just signed with the Dodgers. He's going to spend his first year in Montreal, 1946. So Willie, you know, 15 at the time, thinking, oh, okay. So now I got a chance because my dad told me I got a chance. So he made the best of everything. You know, he played on a couple of minor league, Negro league teams, and then, uh, debuted in 1948 with the Black Barons and played in 49 and 50. Now, recently, as you know, the Major League Baseball, uh, you know, brass decided, along with uh, all these great researchers and historians, that statistics from the Negro Leagues through 1948 would count eventually for with Major League Baseball stats, which is great. Um, but it's just through 48, which... Why? Because that, that was the last Negro League World Series, which Mays played in against Homestead. And anyway, so it, it's wonderful because Willie's stats as a 17 year old are now going to count. And he hit a home run that year. He hit a bunch in 49 and 50, but he hit one in 48. So instead of 660, it's going to be 661. How about that? Yeah. That's such a round number, 660. We'll have yeah. to adjust uh, to that, but it's a good adjustment. It's going in the right direction. Um, you know, I'm curious about those years in, in, in Birmingham, playing at a ballpark that still exists, Rickwood Field. There aren't many ballparks left from uh, home ballparks from Willie's playing days. Most of them are out of service or have been uh, taken down by the wrecking ball, but Rickwood Field's still there. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, it's the oldest uh, professional ballpark in the country, older than Fenway, older than Wrigley. <laughs> that's how old it was. And that's where Willie played in 48, 49, 50. And I went there, you know, for a week to, to research Willie's roots. And I spent almost all my time there, man. It was wonderful just to walk in and, and uh, you know, go out to center field. And I, this is Willie's view. This yeah. is what he looked at. You heard the train go by. And, and when, before I went there, Willie tried to explain it to me. There's a, there's a train and the sun sets over here. And on Sundays, the place was packed and everyone was in their Sunday best because they were coming from church. And, you know, we just packed them. It's just a wonderful place. And I'm 17 and these guys are in the mid twenties, early thirties. These are Birmingham legends. And I'm 17. And I'm the center fielder. A guy named Norm Robinson did play center. He got hurt, hurt his leg. So Willie made it into the lineup and uh, <laughs> luckily so, but uh, yeah, it's it, Rickwood Field. I think everyone needs to go to Rickwood Field. It's a gorgeous place just in a, a neighborhood, right? Um, you know, out of downtown from Birmingham, short car ride. And, uh, and it's, it's, it, it, it's like walking into 1948 because the friends of Rickwood um, who oversee the place, any, any, anytime something breaks, they always replace it with something that resembles 1948. So it looks like it did all those decades ago. So it's still in good condition then? Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. In fact, they filmed part of 42 there. Really? Yeah. And some other baseball movies. If you look closely uh, at the pictures of Rickwood and watch that movie, say, OK, I know that scene was there. That scene was there and that scene was there. And I was told when I was there that there were actually three actors playing Jackie in that particular scene. One who could run well, one who could hit well <laughs> and one who could throw well. <laughs> and they were all they were all in 42 as a little uh, background of that movie. Pretty cool. Interesting. Of course, eventually his contract is purchased by the New York Giants, uh, goes to the minor leagues initially, then first uh, called up in 1951 to New York, struggles terribly, goes through a one for 26 stretch and 038 batting average. I mean, he was almost inconsolable. Did he actually think about quitting the game at that point? He wanted to quit the Giants and go back to Minneapolis where he was hitting 477 and he was a fan favorite. And this is integrated Minneapolis, the Millers, uh, the AAA team, compared with the previous year when he was with Trenton of the Class B Interstate League. You know, remember, he was in the, the Negro Leagues and got signed by the Giants. Now he's in an all-white league. What a culture shock. Not only the only minority on his team, but in the entire league. So he heard things in 1950 his first pro season and you know with the Giants that uh, that Jackie was here and only three years earlier with the 47 Dodgers so uh, he, he never wanted to quit then but one time he revealed to me in our talks that it got so bad at Trenton uh, in that interstate league that he told me one day that I wondered if it was worth it and imagine that Willie Mays quitting because he didn't think it was worth it. Fortunately for all of us, it was worth it. He stayed and, and overcame all that hatred. And, um, and you know, the, the world is better off for it. But by the time, you know, Leo DeRocher called him up, he was 0 for 12, <clears throat> home run off spawn at the Polo Grounds. And like you said, one for whatever, hitting 0 30 something. It, it was not working. And he was at his locker. He was crying. He was saying, man, this, this is too fast for me, man. And Leo came up to me and said, I don't give a darn what you hit. And maybe the language was a little spicier. I don't give a darn what, what you hit. Just keep playing center field and making all those catches and helping our pitching staff. Said, OK. And from then on, he basically started raking. <laughs> you know, I find this relationship fascinating because Leo, as great a manager as he was, was not always known as the greatest people person. Yet he and Willie, for whatever reason, connected. What do you think what it was about their respective personalities that, that made these two guys click? I mean, this was his favorite manager without question during the course of a long career. What was it about their personalities that just gelled so well? You're, you're right. They're just opposites, right? I mean, Willie Mays, the, the kid from Birmingham, didn't necessarily go out at night. And Leo knew all the stars. You know, he was the life of the party. He got suspended uh, by Major League Baseball in 47 because his of, of his association with gamblers being denied the chance to manage Jackie in his rookie year. So eventually he winds up with the, with the Dodgers, with uh, Giants, which did nothing but fuel the rivalry, by the way, leaving the Dodgers going to the Giants. And it, it was chaotic. And, and then Willie comes along and Leo was a smart man because he didn't treat Willie like he treated others. He treated him like kid glove. He treated him like a son, treated him like, hey, don't mess with Willie. Hey, don't do that to Willie. Hey, don't. And they had a lot of, you know, personal chats and a lot of uh, time together. <laughs> it's funny because uh, uh, his son, Chris, uh, sometimes Leo would bring him on the road and Leo and Willie would tell him, hey, you got to watch my kid. So Chris stayed in Willie's room. And why is that? Well, that was one way for Leo to make sure Willie was not going to go out at night. <laughs> he had to stay home and babysit uh, Leo's kid, Chris. So uh, Leo was a smart guy and he made that work. Um, but eventually, you know, he was gone and the Giants brought in just a flood of different managers over the years and nobody compared. I mean, he, you know, he, Bill Rigney, um, uh, Herman Franks, uh, uh, you know, managers who, who, who were uh, working for the Giants under Leo later became managers, but nobody ever measured up to Leo. The first was the best. And, and, you know, thank goodness, because if Willie had a different kind of manager, who knows what would have happened, but Leo was very protected, uh, protective of this kid because, you know, Willie didn't have that personality where, um, you know, th that eventually he, he became, 
you know, he was a little introverted and didn't know people's names and started to say, hey, say, say, hey, you know, say, and then became the say, hey, kid. And, uh, you know, eventually felt comfortable. But it was because of Leo in those early weeks and months that made it possible for for Willie to flourish. John, do you know if Leo introduced Willie to, you know, some of his Hollywood friends? DeRocher was was huge in the Hollywood scene. It seemed like he was making guest appearances on every comedy television show during the 1960s, including uh, the Munsters and Mr. Ed and all sorts of programs. Did did Leo introduce Willie to that world at all? Yeah. Google Bewitched and Willie Mays. And Willie <laughs> makes a cameo with Samantha Stevens and Darren and uh, <laughs> just yeah. hilarious. But, uh, you know, Dinah Shore, uh, uh, you know, Willie was introduced to the Rat Pack by Leo. So, you know, he was playing golf with Dean and you know, hung out with Sammy and Frank sometimes and, and, you know, knows all those guys. And there's a great picture I have of McCovey and Mays and Frank and the uh, all wearing uh, black tuxedos. But, uh, it, it's yeah <laughs> um yeah it, leo kind of took care of willie when when later in life when leo you know worked for the dodgers and uh worked for the cubs and worked for different teams uh he and willie always kind of got back together but, but yeah early in that career um leo kind of showed him around and uh it's not like you know willie was a big party animal like mickey yeah. but uh you know, he, he, he had a lot of fun hanging with these famous people, for sure. I'm a big fan of Bewitched. I saw that episode and they're, they're both at a party, Sam and Willie Mays. And uh, Willie, of course, sees Sam and acts like he's known her for years. And uh, as I recall, uh, Samantha, played by the late Elizabeth Montgomery, uh, says something in reaction to one of her friends, you know, her friends asking her, you know, is 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 Willie you know one of you is he a witch and yeah oh, yeah, warlock. Says, yeah well yeah he's a warlock how do you think he hit so well right <laughs> it's a great scene yeah how, how come you how come you hit all those uh home runs that's that's now we know the answer yes <laughs> very interesting so that came about because of the uh the DeRocher uh relationship another guy John who was very important to Willie was Monty Irvin I believe they were roommates early on they became fast friends too. Yeah. And Willie talks about the walks, uh, you know, Monty lived over in New Jersey and the walks they used to take, um, you know, before games on days off uh, after, uh, you know, train ride back to New York. And um, Monty really took him under his wing. And Monty, of course, could have been Jackie Robinson because so many Negro leaguers back in the day thought that Monty would have been the perfect first guy. And obviously Jackie turned out to be the perfect first guy, but Branch Rickey was actually considering Monty, but Monty, uh, you know, spent time in the military during his career and then came back and wasn't the same right away physically, or maybe even emotionally and said, I need a little bit more time. And Branch Rickey turned to Jackie and you know, history was made, uh, for all the right reasons. And, uh, uh, so, you know, you fast forward and Monty is part of that 1951 team and eventually Willie and Monty and Hank Thompson became the first uh, all black outfield to appear in the big leagues. Monty and Hank Thompson played. Um, they were the first two giants uh, to break the color barrier in the organization. They debuted on the same day. So, um, uh, you know, Monty, a legend, uh, his number retired here in San Francisco, a Hall of Famer, uh, just a wonderful five tool player. Unfortunately, by the time he got to the big leagues, now he's in his 30s. So, you know, white fans missed much of his prime in his 20s that, uh, you know, the Negro League fans were able to see. But what a wonderful person. Anyone who's ever met Monty will tell you that just what, what a beautiful soul. And uh, and he really inspired Willie for all the right reasons. John, one aspect of Willie's career that never gets talked about all that much is his military service. We all know Ted Williams missed about four seasons because of World War II and the Korean War. Bob Feller missed a huge chunk of time. A lot of people, either they don't talk about it or maybe they're not aware of it, but Willie Mays lost nearly two seasons of his career to service in the military during the Korean War. Uh, 
that's a significant loss of time. Right after his rookie year. Um, he's rookie of the year in 1951. Like we said, he gets called up in May and then goes off and helps the Giants win that pennant. Bobby Thompson with the, with the home run uh, at the polo grounds down the line. And then the following May, um, the Army calls. And Willie said, I got to go. And, you know, like Whitey Ford and Johnny Antonelli and Don Newcomb and so many other baseball players who were called into the uh, Korean conflict at the time, they didn't fight. They weren't on the front lines. They played baseball. And why did they play baseball? Well, it was important for the Army at the time to have these baseball players play games for the morale of the troops. Mm -hmm. And and in the book, uh, you know, Antonelli and Newcomb speak with these guys and Willie. It, it was important for them. Um, you know, the, the, the country was together on whatever was happening. And that meant baseball players, too. So uh, <laughs> Willie has this great rookie year. And in May of 52, he goes into the Army and he doesn't come back until 1954. So he misses all of 53, most of 52 comes back in 54, and that's really his introduction to superstardom. He's the MVP of the league, uh, right, in 54. He makes that catch at the polo grounds in game one, the momentum for a sweep over the, uh, the heavily favored Cleveland Indians. <laughs> and, you know, it was Willie's, Willie Mays' catch. They have the Willie Mays World Series MVP trophy they give out every year, and it's a, pic it's, it's a, stat a little statue of him making the catch. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so he missed those two years. And everybody says, well, how many home runs did he miss playing at the polo grounds? How many home runs did he miss playing at Candlestick Park? Well, you know, everyone says quite a few. But most of all, he missed home runs because he was in the military two years. And just like Ted and, and, uh, and Jerry Coleman and all these guys uh, missed prime time, uh, a feller, like you said. But, you know, Willie never complained about it. Because he, even though those two years were missed and he came back in 54 and 55 and he hit 90 home runs those next two years. So imagine even conservatively, if you say, well, he could have hit 60 in 51 and 52. Well, he finished with 660, add another 60. Now he's got 720. That's six more than Babe Ruth. And maybe it was Willie who yeah. was, was first to pass the Babe instead of Hank. But Willie never complains. He, you know, time and time again, he said, John, what's wrong with 660? I say, yeah, you're right, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Did Willie feel that he benefited personally? You sometimes hear from players who have been in the military. They feel that it, it, it instills some personal discipline in them. Some players have come back, whether it's, you know, Korea, Vietnam, and said it, it changed their perspective, made them more serious, more committed about playing the game, working harder. Did Willie talk about that at all with you? Yeah, it meant a lot to him because he, uh, you know, made friends in the military. He, uh, you know, his teammates in the military, um, you know, the pe people he went to boot camp with or whatever, you know, he, they, they kind of stayed with him. And, you know, from, from that experience, uh, shoot, you, you were looked at even more favorably um, for the service that, uh, you know, you provided and, and, you know, for your country. And, and, you know, Willie's proud of that to this day. Um, and, you know, has been honored on many fronts, uh, you know, through the military, uh, you know, for his service. Um, you know, not everybody got called, you know, like Mickey couldn't because of his leg issues and mm -hmm. others. Couldn't, but, um, and, you know, Willie, Willie would probably would rather play baseball and he did play baseball. It wasn't, it wasn't major league baseball, but anyway, he, you know, he looks at that as a positive experience, like everything he's ever done. He looks at it, a positive experience. I mean, even, even losing the 62 series, I said, were you bummed? He said, no, man, I just turned the page and thought about next year. And it, it, nothing ever got him down. And he was always upbeat and he was always uh, uh, the guy that, you know, he wanted um, to be, to, to make his teammates upbeat. And it was all about the camaraderie and, you know, winning the day. I mean, you got to remember the giants, even though they made one world series in the sixties, they had the best record in the national league throughout the sixties. They finished second, five straight years, averaging 97 wins. This is long before the wild card. And Juan Marshall had the most wins in the 60s. They had a great team. You know, the, the fact is there were a whole bunch of great teams at the time. You know, St. Louis and the Dodgers. and uh, Shoot, even the Cubs had a bunch of Hall of Famers. So, um, it's, you know, a wonderful time. You know, the golden era of baseball and, and, 
Willie, Mickey, and the Duke. Uh, it's it, it, it was a great time, and Willie soaked it up. We have about 10 minutes remaining with our guest, uh, John Shea, celebrating the 90th birthday of Hall of Famer Willie Mays, class of 1979. We want to take questions the rest of the way, and you can direct your questions right into our uh, Zoom group chat room. Just type them right in. Uh, we've got some comments and questions, John. Uh, a couple of them are just comments praising the book, but I want to read them to you. Uh, one is from John Stein. Uh, he says, I've read a couple of Willie Mays bios. This was by far the best, all new stuff. It was all from Willie, no bibliography needed. Uh, then also we have from Stephen Wool. John's book is an awesome read, a wonderful tribute to number 24. Uh, the only time I cheered against the Giants was Willie's at bat against the Giants. Uh, once he hit the home run, I was good again. Uh, let's see, we have a question coming in from James, and this is about early in Willie's career. James writes, has Willie ever commented on the alleged sign stealing of the 51 Giants? Of course, all that culminated in Bobby Thompson's home run. You ever talk about that with Willie? Yeah, I brought it up a lot of times. And remember, he came up in May. He was the kid and everybody kind of looked out for him, took care of him. And Willie's line is, I didn't know about it and didn't want to know about it. You hear things, um, you know, at the time. A lot of teams tried to get ahead by stealing signs in all kinds of different ways. The Giants uh, in later years got got busted. Um, but if you look at the stats, you know, Willie's the stat line is pretty much the same month to month uh, uh, on the road and at home. Um, and if you look at that year, the Giants played pretty darn good on the road, too. So if they stole signs, um, it, it, you know, they. Uh, how, how you know how much did it help well did it help by one game that, that was the difference in the pennant they because they beat uh, the Dodgers on the final day but anyway that that's that's what Willie says about it um and uh, you, you, you sort of want to believe him because you know Leo would not have wanted Willie to be part of any scandal like that and his veteran teammates you look around the horn um these are all you know grizzled veterans who have been around for quite a while and knew knew the ins and outs of how to get the edge, but uh, it seemed like they were more protective uh, of Willie than anything. And when he says, you know, I, I didn't know about it, or didn't want to know about it, said, oh, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. We have a question from Jeffrey Cohen about a much later part of Willie's career. Uh, Jeffrey wants to know, how was Willie's relationship with Joan Payson, the owner of the Mets? Well, that's a great question. It, it was a wonderful relationship. She was the one who brought Willie back to the Mets and orchestrated that trade with, with the Giants and Horace Stoneham to get uh, to, to send fifty grand and uh, Charlie Williams to San Francisco so Willie could come back. And, uh, Willie still speaks so highly uh, of Joan, and you know what Joan wanted to do? Joan said that nobody on the Mets would ever wear number twenty four again. She died two years later in like 75 after Willie retired. So the next guy to wear it uh, on a regular basis was Ricky Henderson when he came back to New York. But guess what? Ricky idolized Willie growing up in Oakland and wanted to be 24 just like Willie. So actually called Willie and said, hey, is it okay if I wear 24? And Willie gave Ricky his, his blessing. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, new Mets ownership years later, um, they've given out the number and it's kind of a shame because Joan Payson wanted that thing retired. And you say, well, why would you retire 24 when, you know, he wasn't a great Met and he only played a couple of years and his stats weren't that well. The parallel to that is Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron, just like Willie Mays started mm -hmm. playing in one town, the franchise moved and then he was traded back to that original town on a new team, the Brewers. And mm -hmm. he played two years just like Willie played two years with the Mets. Well, yeah. guess what the Brewers did? They retired 44. So, so uh, Hank's number is retired by the Braves and the Brewers. Uh, Mays' number is retired by the Giants and not the Mets. So I think that that could be taken care of if the Mets were smart about this. John, I found this photo on the internet uh, of Willie during his days with the Mets. This might've actually been when he was a coach a few years later, I'm not exactly sure. I actually remember seeing this photograph when it first appeared. I think it might have been in the New York Daily News. 
And it's, it's just 070s because, you know, the kid's got the windbreaker. He's wearing the helmet like kids used to do. And then it's kind of typical Willie with a big smile, seems to be having a good time relaxing with a youngster before the game. It's, it's, it's all about the 70s, and this is kind of all about Willie's personality too. Yeah, you know, when I, I was over at his house the other day to, to have a conversation with him for this big story that ran in today's San Francisco Chronicle with a, a lot about what Willie's doing now and, um, you know, the, the death of 10 Hall of Famers during the pandemic, uh, um, you know, what he's been doing, what he's going to be doing. You know, the, the Giants just announced the Willie Mays Scholars today and five uh, kids from San Francisco uh, will be honored every year with a scholarship to help get them through high school, help them get them through college. And Willie Mays loves that kind of stuff because it's always about the kids. His Say Hey Foundation um, benefits kids from underserved communities. Uh, uh, and he once was in one of those communities. So he knows how it feels and he can relate to these kids having a, a tough time. I mean, all these kids ought to go to school. They ought to go to college, but they're not getting that opportunity. So, you know, Willie, from the early days, stickball in the streets till now with the Say Hey Foundation, it, it's always been a primary thing. And during my conversation the other day at his home, no matter what we talked about, it always came back to kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about cake and ice cream and taking care of them and having a better life. And, and you know, he's always wearing these old uh, spring training giant hats and he's got boxes of them and he's, he, he gives them away. You know, he says, hey, you know, let's. You know, ha have something here. But more than that, he's he's doing things um, in a, a bigger picture that that's kind of helping the community, helping kids. So that's kind of his aim right now. Yeah. Another Mets related question comes in from Arnold Rich, I believe is how you say it. How did Willie like playing for Yogi in 1973? Well, that's a good question, because Yogi was a little skeptical about Willie May showing up. Right. No. I mean, Yogi's his own legend, right? He's done it all uh, with the Yankees. He won more World Series than anybody. Uh, nobody was better than Yogi. Well, now he's a manager, and he's trying to build this team, and the, the Mets are scuffling, and Willie Mays shows up. He said, oh, my gosh, what do I do with him? So, it, you know, there's, there was a great mutual respect, but I'm not sure how fond Yogi was that uh, this legend was going to be in, um, there every day, kind of overshadowed what he was trying to do, but – when I interviewed all these Mets who played with them, um, you know, from Kuzman to Seaver to uh, Cleon, I mean, so many of them talked about how wonderful it was to have Mays and inspiration in the clubhouse who, who tutored Seaver, who, you know, is a great pitching staff and, and maybe the hitting wasn't there, but Willie kind of made that team believe in itself. And in 73, you know, those Mets were in last place in the division in August, and then they wound up winning and getting to the playoffs and uh, getting all the way to the World Series. Now, <laughs> uh, Willie in 73 was not physically uh, like he was in every other year. It was the first time in his life he went on the disabled list. you got to remember, Willie has the record for most consecutive years with 150-plus games played, 13 straight years. He played in 150, and most of that streak during the 154-game season, before the 162-game season even came about. So he was Iron Man before Cal Ripken Jr., who never did that, by the way, uh, that many seasons, 13 in a, in a row with 150-plus games. So uh, by the end of the career, Willie's got a shoulder. He's not throwing well. He's got a knee. He's not running well. He's got rib issues. He's not hitting well. And September 9th, he pretty much shut it down, and then he retired a couple of weeks later because he couldn't play the ribs, the injury in Montreal. Hmm. He ran into the rail as the first baseman. So game one of the World Series, who, who's hitting third and playing center field? It's Willie Mays. <laughs> you know, he, he played a little bit in the LCS against, uh, against the Reds, but uh, Rusty Staub got hurt, bumped shoulder. So Willie is the opening day, oh, you know, game one starter in, in, in Oakland. By the way, he gets the biggest cheer in the introductions at the Coliseum, a place he never played. But uh, – he got the game-winning hit in game two, a 13-inning win. And then you fast forward to game seven, and Willie wishes he could have pinch hit. He didn't get another at-bat. Wayne Garrett, with a couple guys on, down three, facing a left-handed pitcher, 
And in today's world, they would have gone to the right-handed batter. But Wayne Garrett, the lefty, got up there, popped out, World Series is over. And Willie Mays went home thinking, man, I wish I could have gotten a pinch hit in that situation. And I spoke with a few other Mets, and they said, yeah, that would have been nice, because you never know. I'd rather have Willie Mays and a World Series than, than Wayne Garrett or anybody else. Uh, even at 42 years old, he still had life in him. One final question from our audience, John, um, and I lost the name of the person. I apologize for that. But this fan wanted to know about Willie's relationship with Jackie Robinson. Did they know each other? Uh, did they know each other well? Yeah, they did. In fact, Willie was playing in Birmingham when Jackie's barnstorming team came through Rickwood Field. And Jackie spotted this kid and recommended him to the Dodgers. The Dodgers sent a scout out to look at him in Birmingham, a scout named Wid Matthews. Mm. Wid Matthews' report back to the Dodgers was, the kid can't hit a curveball. So the Dodgers did not get Willie Mays. But, uh, you know, Jackie, w Willie adored Jackie. You know, Jackie uh, reached the big leagues in, in his late 20s, um, you know, married Rachel, went to UCLA, uh, just, you know, just a wonderful life. Uh, as we know in our readings and what we've seen, you know, the movie 42 was excellent. Um, you know, Willie came out of high school. He was 20 when he was in the big league. So his dad always said, you know, Willie, don't say too much. You got to understand Willie's background to understand why he did the things he did. You know, Jackie was outspoken and which was perfect. Willie Mays was not. And Jackie resented that. Jackie wrote a book in 1964, an oral history about the integration of baseball in which he asked all the star players from the time, black and white, to tell their story about integration in the history and, and in the game. So Willie refused because, you know, it, you know, Jackie had been retired by 1964 for several years. Uh, Willie was midway into his career and he wasn't the outspoken guy at the time. You know, he looks back at his father and said, don't say too much. Well, it was always the stereotype that Willie didn't do enough for the black cause. That's what Jackie said. That's what others said. And, and for the purpose of the book, I looked into that and I said, well, let's see if that's true. So I went back and interviewed Reggie Jackson and Maury Wills and uh, McCovey and uh, even Hank, who's three years younger, um, Joe Morgan, who idolized Mays. And they all to a man had anecdotes and stories about how Willie did help them in the 60s during the civil rights movement. And here's how you act, here's where you go, here's what you say. But he didn't do that publicly as much as privately and all spoke so highly of his contributions to the movement. And Bill Clinton told me in the book, Willie Mays makes racism, makes, Willie Mays makes it absurd to be a racist. Mm. But think about that for a minute, the indelible images that Willie presented as a ball player running around and making people happy. And it, 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 it was in this whole chapter about uh, everything about race. So the whole book, there, there's much about race, obviously, uh, because it, it was at the forefront and Willie broke so many barriers and, you know, helped so many people. But uh, it, it's, it's those images that people took away. And it, it's like, you know, I, I have a feeling that Willie Mays, makes people want to do better. Willie Mays makes people want, want to feel better about themselves, uh, do more for themselves, do more for the community, for the fellow man and woman. And it, that, that stuff kind of resonates. I think it did then and now, but uh, for a while there, I, it was kind of uh, perceived as he didn't do enough. But this whole chapter is kind of dedicated to, well, look at all he did. And so now I'm kind of, a, I have a changed opinion based on, the research and the interviews and, and the discussions I had with Willie, because Willie told me the same thing, how he didn't want to get up on the soapbox and didn't want to preach or march or any of that stuff. It just wasn't him. And all these people tell me everybody's different. Everybody fights it their own way. And yeah. that was the way Willie did it. And obviously it was successful. The book is 24 Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid, uh, forward by Bob Costas, uh, written by Willie Mays and John Shea, who has been our guest over this last hour. Uh, terrific book, especially for kids, a lot to be learned there. Uh, and you can get a signed copy signed by John Shea by going to our website. Uh, go to shop.baseballhall.org, then do a search for 24 Life Stories 
and you can order an autographed copy. John, this has been terrific. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Hey, what what uh, better forum to uh, hang out with you on Willie's 90th birthday? So thanks a lot and happy birthday, Willie. Well said. We appreciate it, John. Thank you for your time. We also thank the Ford Motor Company, as always, for their generous support of programs like this, the Virtual Author Series, brought to you on the 90th birthday of the great Willie Mays. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great day, everybody.